Okay. Hello and welcome to um, the fifth Meet the Masters series. Um, we've got a conversation today with Leandro Bugoni and Ross Wanless and a couple of great early career scientists. Mm -hmm. My name is Amanda Gladix and I'm a faculty research assistant at Oregon State University um, on the U.S. West Coast. And I work on a variety of um, seabird <coughs> topics, including um, seabird fisheries interactions and foraging ecology. Um, I want to hand it over to our early career scientists to introduce themselves. Let's go over to Bianca. Uh, hi, I'm Bianca. I'm a PhD student in the University of Glasgow, and I'm doing research with uh, sea and shorebirds, uh, mostly with uh, movements and uh, up to the use of the black skimmer. Oh, that's it. <laughs> and uh, I'm Holly Goyert. So I got my PhD studying the comparative foraging ecology of common and roseate terns and their facilitative interactions with bluefin tuna. And for my current postdoc at North Carolina State University, I'm estimating the exposure of a seabird community to offshore wind energy development. Great. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to provide a brief introduction of our, um, of our featured scientists today. Um, Leandro Bugoni, uh, let me actually click over, so you're not looking at me, you're looking at him. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bugoni is a professor of ecology at the Federal University of Rio Grande in Brazil, and he serves as the leader of the Aquatic Birds and Marine Turtles Lab. He earned his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Glasgow, under the guidance of, Dr. of Professor Bob Furness. Um, his research interests range across, a diverse, across diverse topics and taxa. Um, Leandro works on understanding the movement and trophic ecology, reproductive biology, and habitat connectivity of marine and aquatic birds at field sites in the coastal plains of southern Brazil and on a number of Brazilian oceanic islands. Um, I think it's notable his work also includes um, work on marine turtles, including research into age and growth, foraging, strandings, and bycatch in fisheries. So thank you very much for being here, Leandro. Thank you. And, uh, I have the privilege uh, to introduce Ross Wanless. He's a seabird division manager for BirdLife South Africa. Uh, the Africa coordinator for the Global Seabird Program, uh, as well as an honorary research <coughs> assistant at the Percy uh, Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. He's earned uh, an award-winning PhD studying uh, the impacts of introduced house mice on birds on, uh, off Gough Island under Professor uh, Peter Ryan at the Percy uh, Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. Wandless is on the front lines of seabird conservation in the Southern Hemisphere. His work involves establishing marine important bird areas throughout Africa and associated islands, managing the albatross task force activities to reduce seabird mortality in fisheries in South Africa and Namibia, and strengthening seabird conservation measures and implementations in multilateral fisheries organizations, in particular the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission and ICCAT in the Atlantic Ocean. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for that intro and great to be here. And sure, do you want to introduce yourself too? I realize we skipped I, I suppose I should. Uh, my name is Shubur <laughs> Hammer. Uh, I'm a co-host. Uh, the uh, University of Glasgow, where I study um, breeding ecology of great skuas, uh, with a special emphasis on uh, on their egg, uh, egg egg production. I suppose. Great. All right. Well, I want to just go ahead and dive straight into questions because um, there's quite a few of them, and we've got some questions even from folks who weren't able to join us today. Um, so let's go over to Holly for the first question. Sure. So this has to do with sort of a broad conservation ethics topic. And the question is, how do you balance your role as a scientist versus as a conservation advocate? And how do you show enthusiasm for a movement without sacrificing your credibility as an unbiased researcher? And so let's start with you, Ross. 
yeah, interesting question, Holly. Uh, to my mind, it's quite a simple question to answer for the most part, uh, because the conservation work that I do is based almost entirely on science, and very seldom have to go beyond what the science and the data show in order to achieve conservation ends. There's a bit of an interface there with the precautionary principle and, and data poor environments and not standing back and waiting for more science to be done before you go ahead and answer questions um, and provide advice. But generally speaking, it's you know it's fairly clear cut. So I don't I don't think I've actually ever had to uh, cross that boundary in my career. That's great. Um, let's see what you have to say, Leandro. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question, uh, but not not, e not not very easy to answer. Um, I think uh, in my case uh, there are two two things to to consider. Uh, the first one is how to balance time uh, demands from from NGOs and particularly from government. In Brazil, and uh, international demands are, are abundant. So, if you enter in this avenue, you probably have problems in 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 uh, organize your time to attend conservation demands and also remain as a scientist. Uh, but on the other hand, you cannot say just I'm a scientist, I will not uh, work on conservation. In Brazil particularly, and probably in several countries, uh, there are just a few scientists uh, able to give the right uh, answers to uh, people from government or fishermen or whatever interested in conservation. So the first, the first thing in my case is uh, how to attend these conservation demands and how to be or remain uh, working as a scientist. Uh, sometimes you, you have to say no or you are unable to, to take, take part in a meeting or, or uh, producing reports or, or other stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. The other point is... Uh, and is doing conservation based on science. This is clear cut. There is no uh, margin for speculation. Or, of course, sometimes you should give answers uh, not very clear from the, the science point of view, but um, most time you you need very strong arguments based on data, based on science. Otherwise, conservation is uh, it's not convincing. So um, I'm I'm firstly a scientist, and after that a conservationist. So conservation based on science, and I, I think this uh, it, it's not it's not that difficult. Once you start and, and you make reflections on on your role as a scientist and your role you should play as a conservationist, it's it's, it's not that that difficult. I think those are great answers. Um, I'm happy to move on to the next question because I know there's a lot of other related in issues to bring up. Yeah, that's that's great. Let's go over to Bianca for the next question. Um, so I must say it's a great honor to, to be here with uh, Leandro and uh, Russ. And this question is uh, more about the research. So most of the research with seabirds are in, in the North Atlantic. And they find some patterns for um, how fisheries and um, prey availability are driving the distribution and movements of seabirds. Uh, do you think these patterns that they found of, uh, for example, seabirds following fisheries and uh, their migration being driven by that? Uh, could that be applied to the South Atlantic, or do we have uh, anything special in the South that uh, doesn't match with, with North? So my question is for, for both of you, and I uh, would like to, to hear from uh, Leandro first. Okay, Bianca. Uh, yeah. Um, 
we we start in South Hemisphere later on. So many many things already done in North Hemisphere. We are just scrapping the the surface. Uh, but systems are are very similar. Um, so we should test uh, ideas and uh, patterns discovery or described for Northern Hemisphere. But I think uh, we have some particular uh, situations in Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the first one is uh, in particular for Latin America in both sides of uh, Atlantic and, and Pacific Oceans. Uh, fishing fleets are quite different. Here, most fisheries are based on small vessels, artisanal uh, vessels, and um, the way fishermen work is quite different. Uh, short trips, uh, fish on board is handled in different ways, so no, no or very limited processing on board. In terms of uh, generation of discard, is quite different. This is the first aspect. We, sh we should learn to study su such particular fleets. And the second point is, is, is uh, quite obvious, is uh, we have quite different birds, uh, albatrosses, for instance, which are uh, not common in North Atlantic, at least. Um, and uh, the life stories are quite different. So. For, for most, I, I feel that for most species in Northern Hemisphere, um, perhaps not in North, Northern Pacific, but in the Atlantic, yes, uh, they respond quite differently than albatrosses, extremely case selected species. So at this point, uh, fisher related issues and conservation are very strongly connected, and, and we should be very careful. In, in addressing uh, studies here, because we are working with frequently with critically endangered species, uh, and so most of our studies should be uh, scientific ones, but strongly related to conservation or with uh, applications to conservation. I think these are the most impor important aspects differing southern and northern hemispheres. Great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Ross, uh, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, sure. I'd just like to add a little bit to what uh, what Leander said. And my work with the tuna fisheries um, in both Atlantic and Indian Ocean is quite relevant here. It's pretty much an open question in my mind as to whether or not seabirds are um, causally and significantly responding to fisheries, whether the, the fisheries, particularly the tuna fisheries, are overlapping with areas of high productivity that the same that birds are also targeting. So are they targeting the same sort of general features or the birds around the sea, uh, around the boats and you can move those boats and the birds will move with them. So that's a key question and something that I'm considering, um, I'm, I'm actually exploring that with a potential PhD student to try and figure out some of those questions. And it's, it's, it's pretty relevant because there's some fishing countries that operate in the high seas who are pretty keen on the hotspot concept, and they, you know, they want to see seabird bycatch mitigation measures put in place the way they currently are, which is in a blanket um, south of 25 degrees south. Any tuna longline fishing happens, you've got to use mitigation measures. Um, they'd like to see us targeting those mitigation measures only in certain hotspots, um, and you know, to answer that question, you really need to know: Well, are the birds responding to the features that are there, or are they responding to the to the vessels? Um, and that's so. Yeah, it's it's not a well-known question, but certainly the answers aren't immediately apparent. And I think it's definitely worth testing that. Good, great, um, both great answers. So um, I'm I'm good with them. Uh, Amanda, you can can catch on. Yeah, well, actually, I think we're we're gonna go to your next question next. So it's um, it's actually back to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So, um, this one is specific to Leandro. I mean, you you are one of the few researchers that have uh, gone to to the whole Brazilian sea. 
And as I said, you know how, how fishers work here. They're a bit different from other boys. And the beginning of this year, we had a political issue with the list of uh, threatened species. And when the fish list came out, uh, fisheries and companies, they got crazy and they wanted to put the, the, the threatened list down. Um, I, I would like to know from you, um, do you think this could uh, indirectly affect uh, the seabirds conservation and research? I mean, even um, with the fisheries trying to, to overfish even more, um, just to, to um, conf had a conflict with, with the, the government, or would they just um, avoid the con conservationists on their boats because uh, in vessels because uh, they think we are trying to, to make their work difficult or, or somehow I don't know um, how, how do you think it, this could uh, affect or not the, the seabirds? Uh, thanks Bianca for asking uh, it's a question more related to Brazil, but probably applied uh, elsewhere. Um, yeah, I've worked uh, along the whole coast and, and more recently on the mouth of Amazon, Amazonas River, or Amazon River in, in northern hemisphere. <laughs> so, and we have discovered quite interesting things there. Um, I think. Uh, all this connection uh, between uh, government decisions and uh, the, the direct effect on seabird bycatch, on effects on how we work on board, etc., it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, I took part on the on Brazilian on the preparation of Brazilian red lists on uh, working on, on, on seabirds and some coastal bird species. Uh, and, and, and this, remember, uh, the first question, uh, because we took a, a, a very critical uh, position to define species as in danger or critical in danger based on IC, IUCN uh, criteria and apply this criteria based on the best data we had available, uh, we are very confident that the information uh, could not be uh, flawed by any way. So uh, this is the first point, uh, the credibility uh, of the red list. Um, the, other, the other aspect is how this uh, government decision arrives in fishing communities. Um, I believe that fishermen uh, is, is not uh, will not catch more birds because they are angry for decision or political decisions. Uh, uh, there is a long way between uh, a law or a normative and the fishermen. So this disconnection makes things maybe better for for seabirds. Um, the second point uh, is regarding uh, our work on board. Uh, yes, I think uh, we'll, we'll see the effects, and we already uh, had these uh, effects. Some fishing masters, uh, fish captains, uh, refuse uh, to accept uh, an observer on board. This is an uh, important thing. For the medium or long term, I don't think uh, we'll see an effect because um, we should. Uh, talk and discuss with fishermen much more closely after that and explaining uh, reasons why we define a species as threatened or not and this will make things easier but uh, it's something uh, we should wait and uh, fishermen will forget what we did <laughs> So I think is, is a little bit of patience and uh, and working and explain our reasons. Uh, they are uh, intelligent people, and if you have strong arguments, they will accept it. So I think it's it's uh, at this moment it's complicated, but in the medium or long term, it will be usual. 
Good. So you think it's more like a political um, conversation with them and to solve this? Yes, yeah, some sort of. Um, this is, um, currently, it's very complicated situation uh, because fishermen felt uh, intimidated with several, not particularly seabirds, but some shark species and some fish species uh, included in the red list, so they should not be captured. Uh, this was uh, a very long discussion when preparing the red list because if, if you include one species just because it's nice or you know, other reasons, uh, the credibility of the entire red list will be questioned. And so we were very careful at uh, I think it will, will not be a problem, but now the effects are, are evident in the media and fishermen, or, or some, some, some fishermen, very angry with researchers. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Amanda, um, do you want to... Yeah, I, the next I, mean, not mine, is <laughs> I actually have a question that I think maybe is a nice follow up and and we'll pass it over to Ross to to add on if he, have, he has anything to add to your to your question as well. Um, you guys both work pretty closely with fishermen in your research and as we're hearing it's a group that has historically been and sometimes still currently is at odds with the conservation community at times. Um, so I'm curious uh, what you look for in good research partners in the fishing community. And then, um, sort of as a add-on to that, how do you convince others in the industry who might be more skeptical, um, or and managers also to incorporate your findings into actual fishing practices? Um, so let's go over to Ross first. Yeah, Amanda, that's a that's a really good question. Um, within a with any in any community, uh, you will find people with a broad range of response to any question or circumstance. So if you find a, a good research partner, there's always people in the in any fishery, in my experience, who are willing to give it a whirl, to take you on board, to try and figure out what you're doing and to give you a chance. And there's always going to be individuals or companies who have no interest in what you're doing, who are deeply suspicious of your motives and you know they're just they're old school, they're, they don't like being told what to do, they don't want to consider any new changes that you might be suggesting, they'll be resistant. So there's always a range and you've got to figure out where, you know, where the opportunities lie. Uh, by being close to the ground, by, by meeting with fishermen, by getting integrated into that system, you need to be on the decks, you need to be um, on in the ports talking to fishermen, you need to get a sense of who, those, who that community really is and who the players are and who you can work with. But more than that, to me, the most critical thing in, in working with fisheries is to change our language and to change what we're saying. And I've, I've been talking the same thing, saying the same thing, trying to give the same message for 10 years, um, and only recently realized that no matter what I said, they didn't believe me. Um, and I wasn't using the right language, I wasn't using the right communication tools. Uh, and that's a real eye-opener for me. It's, it, it's not so much where you're coming from, that's important. What's really important is where the fishermen are at. And you need to find a way of understanding where they're at, what their concerns are, and how they're going to interpret what you're saying. Um, and if you can if you can do that, you probably shortcut your way through a lot of meetings and negative behavior and setbacks. Um, so yeah, that's if if you can take anything away from this, that'd be that'd be the key lesson this is adapt your language and adapt your communication systems and try and understand where they are and what their fears and concerns are before you come in trying to solve the problems they don't think are problems. Do you, um, do you have an example of something that you shifted the way you talk about it with fishermen? Yeah, sure. So in South Africa, uh, the Albatross Task Force has done some really amazing work, built off the uh, the Marine Stewardship Council certification that the Hake Troll Fishery took on board in 2004. And that created a, a really clear opportunity for us to get onto the boats and start trialing mitigation measures to, pre to prevent the, the seabird bycatch. They had a really astronomically high seabird bycatch. Right? So it was a real problem. There was 
so much resistance from that fishery to the messages that we were giving them about you know how to tweak things and change things and the scale of the problem and the scale of the impacts of the new measures. Um, and there was a critical meeting. Um, in fact, my colleague Bronwyn, who's the leader of the Optus Task Force team here in, in Cape Town, uh, we went to that meeting and, and she was in tears getting there. She was so nervous. It was such a big deal to talk to to the CEOs of that company and I, you know, uh, well, it's the CEOs of several of the companies. So it was a really big meeting. Um, and we put up some slides, and you could just you could almost see the penny dropping. That you know we were telling them how good they were and how much change there has been, um, and suddenly they they opened up to what we were actually saying. We weren't there to try and squeeze some more money out of them, or we weren't there to you know impose more regulations on them. They realized oh, actually, yeah, we can't most of the way there, and then they realized oh, this, that's what bird life is on about. They they wanting to change this thing, and sort of within two weeks. A letter had gone out to the entire fleet to change their practices. It was a relatively minor thing. I won't bore you with the details, but for us it was key. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was very much frustrating for us to be well. We've been saying this for the last three years. Why haven't you heard us? But we managed to get it into a space and put it, frame things positively, and and you know, convince the CEOs that things were going okay and and we're definitely on the right track. And you know, there, but there were a couple of things they could do differently. And that that made all the difference. It's not always going to be that case, particularly if you're starting off. Um, you need to, you know, you don't have those wins, you don't have that positive stuff to come in with. But there's other examples that you can take from elsewhere to hopefully to show that you know there's solutions exi that exist that seabirds and, and fishery conflicts aren't necessarily the end of the world. There's there's potentially win-wins. So uh, don't come at them with negativity and problems, and you know you've got a huge issue on your hands and you know you need to pay us to fix the problem or are we going to go to the press and sure you, know, you, you really got to think very carefully about how you go into these situations. Thank you that's that's really great advice and um, I really appreciate that that example. Let's uh, let's go over to Leandro what do you you also work pretty closely with, with fishermen um, do you have some insights on this topic? Uh, yeah, well, I, the answer is, is not simple, and I think it, it's quite different depending on which fleet or which sort of fishermen you are working on, or in which country or place. Um, when, when you work with big companies or large industrial vessels, um, the arguments are quite different. You can talk about uh, the importance of conservation and certificates and uh, international markets. But if you work in, in small scale fisheries, uh, you probably find fishermen unable to read uh, with familiar problems in all, uh, a big range of uh, situations. So the language will be quite different or should be quite different. Um, but the, 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 first, the first, first thing, and Ross mentioned that, is you, you, sh you should, ha should uh, put yourself in a position very similar to fishermen. You are not above and, or below, but especially above. This is, uh, some scientists used to be, or to, to retain the truth, which is not, is not fair. Fishermen understand fisheries and uh, seabird interactions much better than us. This is the first point. So you you have uh, lots of things to, to learn from fishermen. If you put in the same position, you will be able to exchange with fishermen. This is a essential point. Uh, and the opportunity to be on board in large trips uh, and stay on board and sharing space and food and uh, and matter in South America, uh, it's very important. So you you can learn and you can pass your information and the reasons. So this is one point. Uh, and uh, fishermen are, are sensible to to questions uh, always uh, if you have strong arguments. So showing a bird living. 40 years and breeding since late, late summer in an island with a 
big chick on the nest and killed by a fishing hook is a strong argument. You can uh, use such sort of information to to make fishermen more sensible. Uh, however, most fishermen understand the language of money. Just that. Just that. So if you, if you find a way to show that they are raising more money by by using a particular mitigation measure or a particular procedure, this will make a huge difference. So you don't need a reason. It's just it's just a matter of money, in, and everybody understands this language. Um, in some countries, uh, some countries I, I've worked. Uh, Falkland Islands, for instance, uh, enforcement is very is very effective, but in other places, uh, pretty much like in Brazil, enforcement is, is is nil. So it's not an option. So you can you can use the language of enforcement on board, on the deck, or by plane or any other uh, way. So enforcement. Could be an option, but not in some situations, particularly in Brazil. Uh, I, I f uh, finally, I, I feel very comfortable in talking with fishermen, and I've learned quite a lot on seabirds, including, and uh, this is quite important. So your your mind changes when you exchange with fishermen, your perceptions and fishermen perceptions. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot to think about. <laughs> thank, thank you for for that answer. Um, let's go over to Bianca for the next question. And I think her microphone is muted. Let's see. It got stuck here. Um, I think uh, the next question is uh, in the same way of thinking, and especially to Ross. So you've been working in many, many fronts of conservation. You're working with mitigating long lines, exterminating rats, and uh, dealing with politicians to establish the uh, eyeballs. And uh, I would like to know from all these aspects uh, to guarantee the conservation of seabirds. What's the hardest issue to to take care of nowadays? What's what's the hardest point to deal with? Um, politicians, fishermen, NGOs, researchers. Yeah, um, it's it's really difficult to nail it down to to one issue, and you know, to some extent, the the different fields are, are they have their unique challenges. So when dealing with fishermen and bycatch, um, getting um, getting compliance to, to know what's actually happening on the deck is really really difficult. That's to me the biggest thing. People can sign pieces of paper, they can sit in a meeting and agree to doing things, but knowing what's happening on the deck. And getting information about where where they're working and what they're doing while they while they're fishing, that's a huge challenge, and that's you know that's almost across the board every fishery if you're facing those sorts of issues. Um, in, in terms of yeah, the biggest issue for seabirds generally, sure, that's a that's a hang of a difficult one to answer. I would say ecosystem the lack of ecosystem approaches to fisheries management. Um, you know that's a massive umbrella, but it, it would encompass a lot of things. So penguins and forage fisheries could fall under that because if we're taking too many of the forage fish out of the water, and the penguins and the gannets and the cormorants and all of the other things are falling over, and if we can stop that by implementing ecosystem approaches, we're in a really uh, much better position. Similarly, with with bycatch, and that's not just for seabirds, it's bycatch for sharks and turtles and cetaceans and other fish species. In any fishery, if you take a, an ecosystem approach and you manage you manage the impact of the fishery on, on everything instead of just managing the target species and, and putting in a few rules here and there on the side to, you know, the likes of bird life who shout really loudly at some of those meetings, 
uh, so taking a, a more holistic approach, again, we'll, we'll have a much healthier ocean. The ecosystems will be more robust. And if we can convince fishermen and fisheries managers that an ecosystem approach is in their best interests as well, it's not to try and put the brakes on their economic activities. It's not to try and make them catch fewer fish. It's really to try and make sure there's a healthier, more resilient and robust ecosystem which ensures healthy, sustainable fisheries. Uh, that's you know that's a key message. So to me, you know, if I could, if I had to pick one, and you've asked me to, it would be it would be that and uh, getting an ecosystem approach to fisheries and um, implemented in a more holistic manner. Uh, currently, it's pretty piecemeal, and I think we really need to up our game on that. Oh, that's great tips and great advice. Thank you very much. Um, do you have uh, anything to add, Leandro? Um, no, I pretty much agree. And I think we'll, I already addressed in the previous questions. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's go over to Holly for the next question. So my question has to do, it's um, moving on to this question of how we reach across borders. And one of the problems in studying the conservation of migratory seabirds has to do with their exposure to different threats across the northern and southern hemispheres. So because seabirds are more accessible at their colonies, we generally have a better understanding of their breeding biology than their non-breeding biology. And roseate terns are a good example of this because they're federally listed as endangered in the United States. Um, and, we have and we have reason to believe that their overwintering ecology contributes to population declines. But we can't explain why or how. And so my question is, what recommendations do you have in encouraging collaborations abroad to establish better connectivity among researchers? And maybe even thinking about these questions of trust between researchers, as well as fishermen, <laughs> as we've been talking about. Um, I'll jump in there, because you didn't ask anyone in particular. Um, it can be a bit naughty and say, throw money at the problem. You know, if you want people to work with you, offer them cold cash, they'll work with you. Um, but uh, in a more serious vein, the, the sorts of collaborations are really critically important um, and you know, creating transparency in, in what your objectives are and, and approaching people with uh, a value proposition uh, is, is key. If you, can, if you can find somebody who's working in that area um, and be upfront with them and say, this is my research plan, I'd like to work with you, here's what I'd like to do and this is what I think I can offer you. Uh, that's a really great way of creating collaborations or realizing very quickly that it's not the right person or the not, or not the right community to be working with. So, I mean, it's not rocket science, it's really basic stuff, but you know, coming in with a value proposition that everyone understands is, to me, the most important thing in ensuring good collaborations. And would you say that um, incentives for funding a project are enough, or do you need more incentives as in, for example, hiring locals to help conduct research or help conduct the studies? Yeah, again, it's going to be somewhat context-specific. Um, small organizations and NGOs are always short on cash, and they always appreciate um, added capacity and building capacity in the, in the local setting. It's hugely beneficial not just for your research question and your study species, but you know, more broadly. So I'm always hugely in favor of, of things like that to build capacity locally. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be entirely dependent on the scale of the question you're answering and who you're trying to get on board and what your resources are. So yeah, it's difficult to know. But Great, thanks. Leandro, what, what do you have to say? Uh, thank you, Holly, for, for this question. I, I think it's, it's very relevant. Uh, well, my, my, my ideas regarding this issue is, uh, well, money, money is part of the answer, but uh, my experience is sometimes um, the, the capacity building in local or in countries or in the wintering grounds 
it's it's not built properly. Uh, we we have several examples uh, in Brazil of uh, old studies carried out in partnership with uh, people abroad, and uh, nothing is is left when people move back. So I, I think this is not the proper way. Um, of course, uh, it's it's pretty easy when you go to a country or a, a new place and do your research and, and, and go back with data and, and that's it. Um, from a scientific point of view, that's fine, but from a conservation point of view, I think uh, it's not the proper way. So building the uh, proper capacity in local places is key, both for conservation, I mean uh, local communities, coastal communities, fishermen, uh, or whatever is involved in the conservation issues. And another another particular topic is living capacity for research. So the partnership in the medium and long term could be much more effective if you leave capacity and after that uh, uh, science could be carried out uh, much easier and much cheaper because you, you can just uh, uh, make connections and you, you don't need to move every season to, to that place and doing the same thing. Uh, this is uh, because I, I live in a, a big country, uh, it's something we try to do when working in northeastern tropical islands very far from my, from my home place, um, but it, it's not uh, easy task. Uh, but moving back to your uh, first uh, issue, uh, I think we are learning quite a lot on the carryover effects and this is, is much more clear now than uh, some years ago uh, that you should integrate wintering and breeding periods and what happens throughout the, the annual cycle of uh, seabirds. Otherwise conservation will be just partial, will not be uh, complete. Um, so living uh, capacity it's, it's a key issue and some initiatives pretty much like uh, exchanging in the opposite way instead of people going to the wintering ground and learning or, or doing research we can send people abroad or people could be to the, the big scientific centers like uh, Europe or elsewhere or North America and learn how to to, to carry out, carry out research uh, and go back. I think this is very or should be very effective in the medium term. It's something we are trying to do in Brazil, uh, particularly more recently with Science Without Borders and maybe Bianca is in this program and uh, this is a way to, to, to create uh, partnership all along the Brazilian coast or in, in any other uh, place, but living living capacity on the ground, I think it's it's a key issue. Yeah. That's great. I, I'm happy to move on with some of the other next questions since we're running out of time. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was a, that's a really some really good points and. Um, so I'm going to actually kind of switch topics here. I'm going to bring in a question from um, an early career scientist who wasn't able to join us, Shiloh Felton, um, who asks, many seabirds nest on prime coastal real estate, which presents an opportunity um, to raise conservation awareness through their visibility to local communities. Um, but that also means that seabirds face substantial human conflicts from both development and recreational activities on those beaches. Um, or in that coastal coastal areas. So they're wondering, are there areas set aside for sensitive species in your region, and are these areas enough? Um, and what types of public resistance have you encountered in, a, in an attempt to conserve affected species, and how do you overcome these conflicts? Well, a lot of questions in there, so <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, I'll hand it over to Ross first. Um. I can, I can relate some experiences from South Africa. It's not work that I personally did, uh, but it's pretty relevant. Uh, where the African penguin, which is 
currently listed as endangered, started breeding in a couple of mainland sites. And, and that's created huge conflict with the residents. Um, and there's no easy answer to that. And I think in some cases, residents will win over and, and they, or developers will, will secure the rights to develop a place. And it depends on the legislative environment. It depends, it depends on the nature of the individuals involved. So it's not an easy thing to, to, um, to say one way or the other. This is how to do it. Um, but certainly, the example in South Africa ended pretty well for the penguins. So they're both both mainland colonies are protected, um, and yeah, we've got a we've got a, a really interesting program now to to try and spread the colonies uh, to, to spread the African penguin population further along the coast. So, in fact, BirdLife South Africa is going to be leading on creating a brand new mainland colony in another part of the world within their range, um, but just in, in a place where there are no islands, uh, so we don't have any choice if we want penguins to move to areas where there's better fish availability, where there's not such heavy fishing uh, pressure, uh, we have to take a mainland colony forward. So we're going to be doing that. So you know, ask me in a couple of years, I'll probably have uh, a very different suite of answers for you. Great. Thanks. Um, Leandro, what What's happening with this in, in your part of the world? <laughs> uh, well, the problem here is a bit different. Um, uh, very, very near to, to my home is a long beach, 200 kilometers long, and you can go from one, one place to another by car. It's just like a, like a road. And uh, of course, in summer, well, we are in the temperate part of the tropical Brazil. <laughs> and uh, in summer, uh, thousands and thousands of cars uh, go to, to the beach. Uh, with car crashes and all this sort of stuff, so it's a very crazy situation. But because the the, the size of the city increased in, tur in tourist numbers increase, the problem is, is really really uh, uh, now it's, it's a a big cause for concern. So we are at the very beginning of uh, setting some places aside. Uh, starting from the less disturbed areas, uh, in order to or aiming to uh, protect shorebirds, but also coastal seabirds, like pretty much like winter interns and resident terns, gulls, and uh, another marine species. I haven't the answer now, but in a few years I'll probably be able to to give a proper answer. I expect some conflicts, especially with beach users. Uh, but I, I don't know, maybe they will be much more sensible to these uh, questions, particular, particularly because we will not uh, suggest uh, that no car will be on the beach. It's just some parts uh, particularly relevant to, to birds. Leandro, just following up from that, uh, you reminded me that South Africa implemented um, a quite a radical strategy to protect beaches and, and not just seabirds, but it was largely driven by seabirds, particularly the oyster catcher, which at the time was listed as either vulnerable or possibly even endangered, um, and essentially put a ban on beach driving across the entire country. Um, only under very, very rare circumstances is beach driving allowed. Um, and that was it was hugely controversial, but there's no question it's made a massive, massive difference. And within a couple of years, pretty much most people have figured out, okay, yeah, yeah, it's not too bad. We can find other ways to get into the beach, and all those arguments kind of, you know, turned out to be uh, a lot more bluster than reality. Um, so if you want any of those lessons, give, you know, give me a shout, and I can give those to you offline. Excellent. It, it's good to learn from previous. Mistakes yeah, yeah. and reinvent <laughs> the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for your for your answers to that. Um, let's go back to Holly for. Um, you can pick any of your questions that you you have left. You've got a few left. You probably only get to one of them. So. Right. Well, I think that since we've been talking about fisheries interactions as well as looking at um, coastal questions of conservation. Um, I'm interested in the division between 
basically scientists that study birds from the colony versus scientists that study birds uh, from um, an at sea perspective and how this, this can cause division um, in our general research perspectives on birds and I'm curious as to how you would suggest synthesizing these two perspectives um, from a con from con conservation perspective as well as a research perspective and I think I'm gonna sort of add on to that um, are there any particular ways that you've encountered um, working with particular sectors so for example nonprofits versus management government and or consulting agencies and academia to try to cross those um, cross those divisions from you know looking at research on the coast versus at sea <laughs> let's start with uh, <laughs> sorry what uh, I was just gonna say who are you gonna put on the spot first <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with Leandro. Okay, thank you, Ali. Um, uh, I think I don't have the proper answer for this question. Uh, I, maybe because I don't see this division too clearly. Maybe because uh, at least here we are just a couple of people, and uh, so. We, we don't share perspectives, uh, but uh, in speaking more generally, I think some methodologies are helping us to, to put all pieces together. Um, when, when we analyze uh, biomar biomarkers or when you track birds, you are connecting the, this or, or getting information from both perspectives, particularly um, well, you should track a bird uh, in a colony and see what what the bird is, is doing at sea. But also, we are, we are tried and and I guess uh, with some success uh, doing the opposite. So we managed to uh, put devices on birds and see. And last summer, for instance, we we put uh, uh, satellite transmitters on nail nosed altars and. Uh, discovered that they are commuting between uh, foraging areas in Brazil and breeding grounds in Tristan da Cunha. And uh, this usually is made in the positive way. So we are connecting uh, both perspectives differently than most or that most researchers used to do. Um, I think NGOs and uh, government or particularly some sectors of the government uh, work differently, and this is very hard to to put together. Um, the the period that birds stay at sea, it's much more uh, it's more related to uh, fishing ministry or people interested in fisheries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you work. Uh, on land, you have to deal with tourism and other sort of uh, problems. Uh, I I don't feel at this moment the need to put all pieces together, at least in, from a conservation point of view, because questions are quite different. But maybe um, in the future we should work uh, more more closely or looking at eff effects in one place affecting. Uh, the other place, but at this moment, for the conservation perspective, I, th I think we can work separately at sea and uh, on land. Um, okay, okay. Does, Ross, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I'll give a brief um, attempt. Um, not really to to. Um, undermine what, what Leandro said, but um, because largely he's right and it very much depends on the state of conservation, the state of knowledge, um, so it's not always possible to combine them and it's not necessary to, to, to have you know, com combining colonial work and at sea work uh, into a single picture, but it can be really powerful. Um, miniaturization of devices now and, and you know, the, the load costs of tracking devices means that 
there are very few seabird species left for which we can't really do any tracking. Um, so we can start increasingly to get great ideas on where birds are where, where birds are moving, and coupling that information. Uh, so, so that sort of research should really be addressing the threat at sea, um, in my view. Trying to understand where, the, where birds are going when they're away from the colony and what are they encountering there and, and are there any threats that we can address. But if you can couple that to the population decreases in colonies so that you, you really have a strong coupled model and you can link fishing activity or bycatch rates or recreational use of beaches or whatever to those decreases, you've got a very powerful case. You can really start to to, to put some hard data together that people can't really challenge. So it kind of depends on the question, the species, again, you know, so much is context dependent. Um, but if it's early days, um, you know, you, you've got to pick your battles um, and doing colony stuff is, yeah, it's the low hanging fruit and if you don't know that much about species, that's probably where you should start to try and figure out what what's going on at the colony before you get into the high tech and expensive and complicated work of finding out what they're doing at sea. Okay. Um, I'm going to let Amanda take it from here since I think we only have a couple of minutes left. We Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks for those answers. We do only have a couple of minutes left, but we wanted to throw in at least one um, possibly fun question. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Sher to, to read that one, if you don't mind, Sher. You're, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, uh, this is an easy one. Tell us a story when something went wrong. And uh, Leandro, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, well, there are, there are several stories um, much better telling you in a pub table. But, um, well, one, one funny situation was when I, I landed in Martin Vaz, it's a small rock uh, close to Trinidad Island, and the uh, fisherman gave us a ride to there, and the place was... Uh, it's usually visited just by Navy people every six months or so. So we land uh, with uh, needles, syringes, rings, uh, binoculars, uh, everything inside a rubbish plastic bag and with a bottle of water and uh, some biscuits. That, that, that's all. That's all from our very organized expedition. And uh, in by by midnight or so, it started to rain, and uh, these these sleeping bags were completely wet, and we we were in the middle of the night in a remote island with nobody around, uh, myself and another uh, scientist. And the only way to keep temperature was uh, entering the rubbish plastic bags. There are pictures on that, and uh, not 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 not. Uh, that nice pictures, but uh, we stayed the rest of the night inside a rubbish bag, uh, trying to keep the temperature, and it was a really, really long night. I thought you were going to tell us how you had to get into the sleeping bag with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll follow up with a, with a, a very short story. When I was uh, at Goff doing my PhD research with my wife, Andrea, um, during winter, we had to go up and count the albatross ticks in, in some of the colonies on a regular basis. One day, um, the snow came down quite heavily, and the next morning, we woke up and it was white up in the highlands. We thought, "Oh, great! Let's go and let's go up to the up to the colony to do the count." And we got there, and we realised we were trying to count white, fluffy things in a white, fluffy environment. Um, and we, <laughs> we quickly realised we were being complete idiots. There were no ways we could do any counts of any description, so we just took the cameras out and played for the afternoon and then went home. That's, that's great. Thank you both for sharing those, those stories. <laughs> it's, it's always nice to hear that you know early career scientists aren't the only ones that get themselves into silly situations. <laughs> so thank you. 
Um, we are pretty much out of time now, but I wanted to um, thank everyone for, for coming, especially Ross and, and Leandro, as well as Bianca and Holly. We really appreciate um, you all being here and, and taking part in this conversation, um, as well as the folks that are watching online and those that submitted questions. There's lots of questions we weren't able to get to today, um, but we'll pass those along to Leandro and, and Ross and see if they can provide some, some answers offline. Um, I also wanted to mention we have just one more um, Meet the Masters session coming up on October 5th at um, 8.30 p.m. GMT, so figure out what time that is and where you live in the world. Um, and that will be with Dr. Peter Hodum and Dr. David Towns. Um, and they'll be discussing island conservation in a community context. So we'll be kind of focused on the colonies for the for the next round, um, and then we hope to see everyone in in Cape Town um, at the end of October. Um, but even if you aren't able to make it to Cape Town, we hope that these um, sessions have been informative and a way to connect with other seabird researchers um, throughout the world. And let's see, sure. Do you have anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? Not really. <laughs> I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming. and um, Thank you for organizing. And thanks for everybody's time. It was an honor being here. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was great. All right. Thanks. Thank you for the great opportunity. Thank you.